<clears throat> Welcome to Straight Talk with Billy Kay. I'm Billy Kaiserling, the person who has the distinct honor of being mayor of my hometown, Beaufort. While I have many responsibilities, I believe one of my principal activities should be leading a civil conversation with the people about the future. I write periodic newsletters sharing information and sharing comments, inviting people to respond. And now we're producing, not at city expense, I might add, a straight talk with Billy Kay, where we share community goings on in and around Beaufort. Today I have with me my guest, as my guest, a very interesting guy. I could spend our whole half hour telling you about John Dorch, but I'm going to tell you how I met him and then let him introduce himself. About a year ago, in the heat of the summer, um, I got a phone call in the afternoon that there had been shots fired over by the Charles Lynn Brown um, Recreation Center, also known as the Green Street Gym. I was invited to a house around the corner and walked in and talked with some of the young men who had been involved as victims. The next day we had a community meeting and I walked in the door and there was Reverend Dorch. Why I had heard about him and I knew a great deal about his, his past, um, it was the first time we ever shook hands. First time. So I have with me today uh, Reverend John Dorch, who's the pastor at the, at the Central Baptist Church and the founder and leader of the Circle of Hope Ministries. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Welcome, and thank you for having sure. me. Sure. I remember that day. It was quite something for me. Um, a, because the young men trusted me in the room, and two, <clears throat> the neighborhood trusted me to invite me in the room yes. so that we could begin to start a dialogue about, about these young people about the heat of summer, about unemployment, about lack of opportunities. And it just so happened that the Green Street Gym at that point and one year later is still closed for those young men yes. who used to have a safe place to go to play basketball. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into the problem of, of young men on the streets who are bound to get in trouble unless the rest of us are there to help them. Okay, let me begin by saying that um, I'm a native, native Bufordonian. I was born and raised here in Buford. Uh, my father was a Baptist minister and following suit, and uh, also an entrepreneur, even though he only had the benefit of an eighth grade education. My mother was a scholar in the family, um, and um, she taught me the value of education. Uh, when I graduated from Robert Smalls, I left Buford and I went to Howard University. And there I became involved in the Army ROTC program, and I became the top cadet. When I graduated, I received a regular Army commission, and I went to Fort Benning for jump school, ranger school, and IOBC. Uh, while in ranger school, I volunteered for Vietnam. I didn't get caught up in politi politics of the, mom of the moment, but um, I felt a compelling need to go there because they were drafting a lot of young men coming up high school and forcing them to go over there and to fight that war. 22 years old, my mission was to go over and take care of the younger guys. So while in Vietnam, I was injured while saving the life of a man under my command and receiving medical retirement. When I got out of the military, I went back to Washington, D.C. and went to work for New York Life Insurance Company. Had a very successful career. Um, after I left New York Life, then I wanted to establish my own business, a small investment company, a holding company. And I put together a pool of talent, young men who had gone to Howard with me and got advanced degrees in different disciplines. One guy had a PhD in economics from Stanford University, another guy an MBA from Wharton, another guy was an attorney with an MBA in money and banking. So they were my board of directors. And I went out and hired 20 young men and women and trained them to get the securities license to sell stocks and bonds to invest in the community. Well, because sales came so easy for me, I overestimated the potential of the sales force. Consequently, um, I ran into a cash flow problem. Um, and so I had to make a decision, either declare corporate bankruptcy or to do something stupid. Well, I opted for the latter, to do something stupid. Conscience was weighing on me, Billy, and I didn't want to see the people who had invested their money lose their money. So um, I decided to go into banking business. I recruited five guys, and I trained them like a military unit to start robbing banks. So what had happened, one of the guys on the team wanted to go out and buy a brand new car and a house, and I said, if you were to do that, you're going to bring heat on the team. So he left the area, and I recruited another guy to take his place. Unbeknownst to me, he was a paid FBI informant, and that's how they infiltrated the organization. Things went awry, and as a result of that escapade, I wound up spending 15 years in a maximum security penitentiary. When I got out, I went to law school and passed the bar in D.C., Maryland, West Virginia, and uh, taught at the law school for a while. Then I headed some national nonprofit organizations, working with at-risk youth around the, the nation. Dallas, Houston, Washington, D.C., uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And that, you know, that experience uh, really was my calling, my mission. I have a burden for our young people. 
uh, especially those who are labeled at risk. You see, because these young folk have so much potential, they need to be valued and embraced and engaged. And they can set the world on viability. They really can. Right now, I'm mentoring a young man who was labeled as um, academically uh, deficient, or even worse, he was labeled as being uh, learning disabled. And uh, I started spending time with him. He spent time at the library <coughs> doing things and working with him. And I found out that he was a very bright young man. A lot of these kids that are labeled at, at, as at risk and, and uh, academically deficient, they might be academically deficient, but they're not intellectually deficient. It's just a matter of they're focusing on their academics and they haven't been doing that. A lot of these young people we classify as being um, at risk. You know, um, they come from a disadvantaged background. And uh, let me interrupt one mm -hmm. second because <clears throat> one of the challenges I think is that when kids get labeled mm -hmm. at risk or when they don't have the support at home, mm -hmm. they're out on the street and they make bad decisions. Yes. Can we talk a little bit about some of that? You made a bad decision. Absolutely. So you, you're clearly someone who Absolutely. should have the credibility to, to work with these kids. But, but what are the bad decisions? What pushes them to the bad decisions? What's the peer pressure? Yes. I'm glad you asked that question. Normally, um, most of the kids, um, a lot of them are coming from a single parent female head of household. I'm talking about young men in particular right now. And they don't have any positive role models in their, in, in their life. So what they're doing, they're learning their values from their peers. And right now we have a universal culture, youth culture. And you know, with social media and, and those types of things, you know, they're exposed to the wrong kinds of things. So what are the things that they really need, um, and it's, no, it's not rocket science, is a positive role model in their lives to help them to redirect their energies, uh, to reestablish values in their lives, because what it boils down to is a values problem. And I think even within the community, I don't think that we value these young people as we ought to. And consequently, being not valued, they don't value themselves. You see, so again, if we could really... So how do we, how do we embrace them? And I, I take it that's a big part of what Circle of Hope Ministries is. Absolutely, absolutely. Right now, I'm working with a number of organizations to provide mentors for our young people. You see, and what the mentors do is they, they present that role model. And they are actively communicating with these young persons. They are active in their lives, and, and they get them steered in the right direction. But also, there are young people who are serving as mentors for their peers. You know, I think because sometimes they hear more clearly what their peers say than they would what we're saying to them. So again, we engage them, restructure their value system, getting them to appreciate what an education can do for them, what it means to be in a positive environment, and what it means to continue to focus on develop, character development. And as a part of that, the total person, Billy, we look at their spiritual development, we look at their moral development, their educational development. And if we're gonna address this problem, we have to do it as a community, as a community. So I would engage all the stakeholders, academia, religious community, social organizations, all of these groups must come together, you know, and it has to be collective effort, you know. Okay, you got one. I'm a volunteer. Okay, I want, great. I want to mentor somebody. Okay. Tell me how. I, tell me a little bit more about Circle of Hope, how it's structured. We've got about a minute left. How it's structured and how, if I were watching this show rather than sitting here with you, I could get in touch with you and, and go to work with you. You know, one kid at a time is, is a lot more than no kids at a time. That's the way we do it, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. You would call me, and I would link you up with a young person. I would introduce you to that person. We would screen and introduce you to that person. There's an application process. You would meet the parent. The parent would have to sign off on the arrangement. The kid would have to sign a document as well uh, as to being committed to this relationship. Once that is done, there will be opportunities for you to meet with a group of other mentors in a group environment with the young person as well. And then once that has happened, then you're going to introduce yourself to the school system, the teachers, uh, to find out about his friends find out about the kid, what he's interested in. About how much time a week would I? Uh, probably about um, an hour and a half to two hours a week is all that's required that's to commit. That's, that's not a lot of time when I think about the time I waste, is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. You know, I'd be quite candid with you. you know, I, there's so much I can share with you, but I, I feel a little hum, hamstrung by the time component here, you know, the time pressure here. And time is pushing us, but we, we, we might get you back, or maybe we'll bring, after I've mentored a kid, someone for a year, maybe I'll bring that, that, that kid with me. Okay. And we'll, we'll do a follow-up show. After following you, the second half of the show, we're going to have Fred Lida, okay. who has done every kind of social service job and worked with young kids when I first met him at, at Beaufort um, Marine Institute. I've met Fred. So tell the viewers how they can find you. Okay, um, you can email me at circleofhope at hargrade.com or you can call me at 
379-9955. We'd love to hear from you. I'd encourage you all to call John Dorch, Circle of Hope <coughs> uh, Ministries, um, and join me, and let's, let's each, one, one by one, work with some of these kids who, are, who need some help. Thank you, John. You're very welcome, and thank you, Bill. All right. Welcome back to Straight Talk with Billy Kay. The first segment of the show, we had Reverend John Dorch from the Central Baptist Church, clearly an unusual man with an, an unusual background and a very um, aggressive, positive uh, role that he's playing in the community, mentoring young people. As I said then, it's just about a year ago that some young men were, were shot at by some young men who had made some bad decisions in their lives, who thought that brandishing a, a firearm uh, made them big, made them strong, gave them identity. Um, <clears throat> and they're very often, as, as Reverend Dortch said, you know, there are a lot of reasons for this, but notwithstanding the reasons, we can't really look back at the reasons. What we have to do is look at these kids who are lost, who don't know where to turn, and when there's a bad influence that looks exciting, unfortunately, they turn to that. With me in the second half of the show, I have Fred Lida, who is someone I've known for over 20 years. Fred has been involved in probably every social service, work with kids, save the poor, <clears throat> help the needy, educate the uneducated, feed the hungry program I've ever heard of. Fred's got the biggest heart of anyone I know. He's here today as the director or the coordinator for an organization called COSI. It's called Collaborative Organization of Social Services for Youth. Welcome, Fred. Thanks, Billy. Why don't you take a minute and tell us a little bit about COSI? Okay. Um, actually, Buford County is pretty unique in the state of South Carolina. We are the only county that has an interagency team like COSI that meets on a regular basis. Uh, every, any child in Buford County, birth to 21, that is in need of residential or therapeutic, whether that be emotional, behavioral, or psychological therapeutic services, that family can come to the COSI team where a representative from all the youth service agencies in the county are represented around that table so that the family can tell their story one time and they can get all of the pieces of services that they need integrated into one treatment plan as opposed to the family having trying to negotiate that themselves. So it's unique in our state um, to have that kind of a collaborative effort and we found it to be very helpful. Uh, over the last 15 years we've seen some huge changes in terms of the, probably the number one I would say is the length of time that children are kept away from their families. Um, if, if a therapeutic service is really going to be effective, it needs to connect the family with the child. It doesn't do us any good to remove the child from the home, do all kinds of work with the child, but if we don't do anything in the home and that child returns, chances are they're going to go back to the way they were. Sure. Let's talk, let's talk about the child that doesn't have a home like you had. Okay. Or a home like I had, <clears throat> where the parents are likely a single, a single parent. Uh, likely commuting a great distance to work, yep. likely leaving before the kid gets up in the morning, not and coming, getting home, getting home after, after supper. Yep. And these kids are out there lost, particularly in the summertime. School at least gives them some structure. I think personally we put way too much of a burden on, on the, the public school system and on teachers who end up taking on parenting functions rather than being permitted to do what they're trained and hired to do. <clears throat> but we got a kid who's walking down the street you know, doesn't have anything to do. Or it's summertime. They're walking around the park and they see a group of five kids who are probably up to no good. Right, um, which because, is more appealing. Because, they're, because they don't have anything to do. Right. And that kid is really, really doesn't, knows that, but, but, but doesn't know where else to go. You know, what kind of places, what is the need? John talked about mentoring. And John probably had the, the heart of it right there. Um, the, there's been a lot of research done on what can prevent a child from going down that road and making those bad choices. And the number one factor, overriding every other factor, is that you have a loving, responsible adult in your life. Somebody who's excited that you're alive today. <clears throat> and that person be somebody responsible so that a child can see that appropriate way of behaving with the world. It's, it's really not about what you say to kids, it's what you show them. When they see you go through a checkout counter and they see an exchange between you and the cashier, and if you become angry and that's your way of dealing with a mistake, 
the child sees that. If they see that you talk things out, the child sees that as well. So it's, it's really about that role modeling. Well, you know, in, in the, the series of meetings that we had after that event, and uh, you know, we had a drive-by shooting on St. Helena. We haven't, fortunately, haven't had anything in the city recently, but just this, just this weekend, I think we had a drive-by mm -hmm. <clears throat> on St. Helena. And, and the real question is, you know, I've talked to the police department. In fact, I was very surprised when I went to that first meeting. Uh, before I got there was the chief of police saying, what can I do? And I said, chief, you catch these kids. <laughs> You're on top of it. Yep. You know who they are. What, what can we do to help you? He said, I need the public. He said, I need people to point them to me, and then I need places to send them. He said, you know, one of the great things is that our, our, our school resource officers in the summer, we put them on the street because they do know the kids. They know the kids, and that's right. They are a place that some of the kids will turn. But the world has a lot of bad choices, and I always remind myself when we get angry at the parents or we want to blame the system or we want to talk about the welfare society or all the bad things, <clears throat> number one, these children did not choose to come to this earth. That's true. And number two, they weren't born stupid yep. or learning impaired. Or violent. Or violent. Um, and number three, they don't know how to make choices. And, you know, I made bad choices as a child. Fortunately, there were we different all kinds of bad choices. So the question is, you know, <clears throat> within the organizations within COSI, um, we have the Boys and Girls Club. Um, the Green Street Gym, unfortunately, lack of resources was, I mean, it's really a shame. And the city has talked with the county and trying to figure out how right in the center, at least in the downtown Beaufort, um, I have to say that the majority of the problems, fortunately, are not in downtown Beaufort. Um, they tend to be out on the Rural island areas. Where, where, where there's nothing for kids to do. At least here they can come and throw a fishing line, a shrimp net, <clears throat> ride their bikes downtown or do something. But you're out on the islands, you got no place to turn. You don't have a car and the likelihood is if you get into a car, <laughs> there's a 50% chance that someone is up Stolen to no it. good. It's, 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 a, it's someone is up to no good. So the chief says, you know, to me, and this is what I want to talk to you about in our remaining few minutes, is, you know, how do we penetrate that system? How do I, I talk to John, I said, I'll, I'll mentor somebody two hours a week. I'm a busy person. I have a full-time job. I'm the mayor. That's a full-time job. Social responsibilities. But if I can't find two hours, foo, you know, fooey on me, but where do I go? Yeah. We have several programs that kids can get involved in. There's the MOST program, Men of Strength, that's uh, happening. It's a national model. And we have a chapter here that's become very strong. We have LOUD, Living Out Your Dreams. Uh, the arts and media program that gives kids an opportunity to be able to express themselves in a safe place where they can talk about what's happening in their lives and the struggles that they're having. Um, probably the number one thing I see is the after school programming. Almost every school we have has after school programming, but transportation is the problem. Um, we have kids that would like to be able to go, but they have no means of being able to either get home afterwards or, you know, the transportation, again, comes down to the, the real struggle. So folks that would be willing to transport kids to programming um, and certainly mentoring, I can't stress that more strongly enough. Yeah, I went to a program that's a little different, this uh, Thumbs Up, which is for, for the younger kids. Um, remarkable because I think there was many volunteers there. Yes, working with the kids. It's hard to the, get volunteers that kids. will work with teens and middle schoolers. Yeah, it's it can be tough. Yep. you know, but it's you, a challenge. You were tough. <laughs> I, I was tough. Again, they're human beings, and I believe they're all good. Uh, there are some bad eggs. There are probably some who are destined to incarceration and maybe forever. Yeah, there may be some where corporal punishment. I've had a long conversation. Is going to be necessary. But that's a very small number. I agree. I think uh, holding out a hand and saying, I'm going to be your friend. You can call me any time, yep. day or night, if you think you're on the verge of making a bad decision, and I'll come be there for you. Um, but if I want to, again, I'm, I'm a parent, and I know my kid's astray, but the kid doesn't talk to me. Yep. Um, <clears throat> who can I call to see if I can find someone? To hook up, would it be the same? Would it be the same resource? I mean, it, you know, cozy is family oriented, and it's to keep families together. Right. But sometimes families who live under the same roof are, are not by together. no means together. <laughs> and and we have a, a program within cozy called family group conferencing that often will help families to deal with this. Um, what it is is you're looking at pulling together a large group of the family's support network, and then working together as a group to come up with a solution for the individual family need. It gives families the opportunity to work out a plan for themselves one that's not being imposed on them. 
Just have a few more minutes. Tell us how we would find, I can't ask everybody to find you, because I can never get you. <laughs> You're always in meetings with all these different groups. <laughs> but what would be the central place if I see something, I got a kid who, who's looking for help, what would be the, the best number in, for In the call? Buford area, in I would Buford. go through John Dorch. He's got a great program. Um, if you're in the outlying area, I would go through your schools. Most of the schools have programs. Even in the summer, they will be able to put you in touch with the folks who'd be able to follow up with those programs, those mentoring programs afterwards. Well, thank you, Fred. We could, we could go on for hours, hours. but, but we, we, we don't have time, and that's the problem with the window of a short show. <clears throat> thank you for joining us. Thank you, Fred, for, for being with us. Thank you, Billy. Again, I'm Billy Kaiserling. You're watching Straight Talk with Billy Kay. If you'd like to share your ideas about this program, or if you'd like to get on my newsletter list, you can email me at billy at mayorbilly.com. Thank you for being with us.